Well, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Uh, we uh, got another, uh, well, here we are, another week. We just keep rolling around. I keep getting older. Uh, I don't know. One of these days you're going to say, what happened to Tony? No lesson this week. Well, you got to go down to Chris Grubbs and find him down there. But uh, as, as we, we got one more beautiful day, and this is a beautiful week because it's Thanksgiving week. And we're thankful for our country, for for God's love to us through Jesus Christ. There's, it's just unbelievable what we are blessed with here in this country and our world, and in my life particularly. And I mean, there's a lot of things that's happened to all of us, but God is still here with us, keeping us safe. And even though we go through some difficult times in life, his love never leaves us. Let's have a prayer and we'll start this lesson. Our Father and our God, as we approach your throne, we praise your name and we thank you for your love and grace and mercy to us. Thank you for how you've blessed us with all the riches that we have and the blessings of life. But Father, the biggest blessing of all is your grace and your mercy shown to us through your son, Jesus. His righteousness, his goodness, and his salvation has, Father, you've saved us. You've given us hope. You've given us life. Guide us now as we study your word. Fill us with it. Your word is so precious to us. Help us to understand like we've never understood before and see like we've never seen before. Glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're in a, a new lesson this week. Of course, it's, by the way, uh, it's a lesson, the last lesson of the quarter, I guess you'd say. Uh, go, we start a new quarter going into December. But God's image in the nation is what we're talking about today. And uh, it's kind of kind of uh, all over the place, to, uh, This is these scriptures are. But we've got a scripture in Genesis, the fifth chapter. We've got a scripture in Psalms, 139. And we've got a scripture in Luke. And I, I think we've got one in Second uh, Corinthians, yeah. So anyway, we're going to read this thing here. Uh, in Genesis, the fifth chapter, verse one, it says these words. This is the document containing the family records of Adam. Now, this is, uh, Genesis has a lot of things in it, but as it, if we get to chapter five, verse one, it says this is the document ch containing the family records of Adam. On the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female. When they were created, he blessed them and called them mankind. So we, we have man and woman, but it's really mankind. And uh, woman is really, you know, God looks, when God calls it, he calls us, when he talks about men, he's talking about men and women. He's talking about the creation he had of us. And as, as, we, as we look at the scripture here, we realize that, that God did these things. If you go back and read Genesis, it's good for every Christian to go back and just read Genesis once in a while because it opens your heart and your mind to, to realize that God is in control and God did create the world and the universe. It is a, it's a beautiful thing to read. And as we, as we see this, we see, and, and then we've got Psalms 139, 13. Let me read this to you. It says, For you... It was you who created my inward parts. I just love this psalm. It's a, it's a big, long psalm. And, and uh, it says, It was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Yeah, think about that. It was God that did all that. You know, we, we kind of tend to, in this day and age, we treat life so frivolous. It's just like uh, a, a person's life doesn't really matter. You know, uh, if they're old and and uh, running out on the end of the string, there they uh, we have a tendency to say, well, they're they're kind of a dead weight, and and, we, and sometimes uh, they want to get rid of them. Well, same thing with babies. On this, on the head end of the thing, what do they do? We're aborting babies all over the world. It's a carnage that's that's unequal to any war we ever had. It's really a mess. And so when you think about this, God created 
human beings in his image, in his likeness, it says. And uh, you can, it, he blessed them. Uh, it, it says, he created, made them in the likeness of God, in the image of God. Well, what would that be that, that's different? Of course, we're not like a cow or a horse. We have some, we have something in us that's different. And that is, we have a living soul, a spirit. That spirit is after the very spirit of God. It's the nature of God. He's, he's put a, his likeness inside us. And he's made us so that we can, we can love him and share our lives with him and, and be his family. That's exactly what he's made us for. He wants us to be his family for all eternity. He wants us to be, he's created horses and elephants and dogs and cats, but all those do not have the soul in them. Oh, we've got some people that think, well, you know, my dog is as important as anybody that ever lived. Well, it may be to them, but it's certainly, it's, it's got to have its place. Everything has its place and its order. And, and God to, is, as God looks at us, he looks at us with a special eye because we're made in his image. And what does that mean? It means we can actually fellowship and share our lives with him. Spiritually, we can do that. Now, you know, I'm sure that the donkey, uh, the, the little donkey that rode Jesus into Jerusalem knew who was on him. But he couldn't share his life with Jesus like we can. And and that's what this is talking about here. People are made in the image of God. Now, what that really means is they're made into the family of God. If we were, of course, we had sin, which separated us from God. But if you look, if you go back and read Genesis, you see that God sought Adam and Eve out. God, they didn't come looking for God and ask him for help. They went and hid from him. And God hunted them out, searched them out, and went to where they were. Do you, do we realize what that means? He sent He sent Jesus down here to die for us. Jesus came down here to where we are. He came down here and lived in a body like we do. He felt the same pains and and cold and heat and he felt hunger and he felt sorrow and all those things like we do. He came down and took a, took on a body of a human, and he was God, and he paid for our sins, and he suffered our punishment for our sins, and was separated from God because of it. That's what this <clears throat> created image of God means. And so in Psalms one thirty nine, he says, he says I will. He says, you created my inner parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wondrously made. Boy, that is that is a statement of that it says your works are wondrous, and I know them very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret. When I was formed in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw me when I was formless. Now some of these folks are saying that we don't have life in a baby when it's first conceived. You need to read this verse. Let's just read that again. It says, My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret. When I was formed in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw me when I was formless. That tells me that that baby is a baby. It tells me that God is paying attention to every single stage of its life. And especially when it's first conceived. The most dangerous part of its time there and, and God is with it and he's paying attention to every single second and he says your eyes saw me when I was formless all my days were written in your book and plan before a single one of them began this is the most powerful statement I, 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 I mean how could it be more powerful than this all of my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. Now, do you think those babies that we were born, God had a plan for each one. I don't know why he allows some people to have babies that 
that really don't take care of I don't understand all that. But I know this. It's because of sin that causes these problems. It's sin. It's not God's fault. He created us in, a, in his image. He created us to serve and walk with him. And these babies, he wants them all. He can, any baby, some of the, some of the most successful. Let me, let me try to word this in a way that makes sense. Some of the people in this world that have blessed the earth completely have had the worst moms and dads on the history, really. Who did nothing, cast them out, sent them to orphanage, all and didn't didn't take care of them. And of course, there's been some babies in the orphanage where the parents were killed, but God took care of them even with them. Some people cast their children out and didn't even want them, but God took them and made them a person that blessed the earth. You see, God has a plan. If we'll open our hearts and souls to that plan, he wants to bless you so richly you cannot comprehend it. And that's what this lesson's talking about today. We're made in the image of God. God made us different than the animals. We are created in his image and we, are, we have an eternal soul or spirit that will live in heaven or hell forever. It's not like that we're just going to, when we die, we go off into some kind of a mist and, and evaporate into the eternity or something. No, no. We're going to be somewhere f forever. Our soul is physically either going to be with God or it's going to be in hell. Because you see, there's only two places you can live in this, in this universe. One of them is with God. and One of them is in hell. Now we have a, a life here on this earth that allows us to make a choice which one it's going to be. And as we look at the image of God, we see his greatness and his love and his mercy. And he's made us so he, why did he make us what he did? He made us so he can love us, so we can love him. But he, he didn't make us so we have to love him. He didn't make us so that it's a necessary thing for us to love him. In other words, he lets us choose what we want to do. So he doesn't want somebody to love him because he's a taskmaster. And he's, a, he's a slave owner or something. He wants us to love him because we choose to love him. God made us like him with a soul that will always exist. We don't get much out of this lesson. Get this. We're going to live somewhere forever. Or we're going to die somewhere forever. Because to be apart from God is to die forever. But it tells us what happens is that God, is, is God has got a plan. He's going to separate good from evil. And evil is going to be locked up because it's a strong force. It's also strong. And God's going to lock it up and use up its energy. And that's what hell's all about. And I could, you know, we could go for days preaching about hell, I guess, but but the truth is, hell is simply a place that God's going to put evil, lock it up, and keep it there. Not only keep it there, he's going to use up its energy so it can't escape. And so we have a choice. If we choose God, we go to heaven and glory and, and life with him forever. If we choose not to serve God and do it our way, then he's going to let it, and then we're going to go we're automatically. Jesus said, I didn't come to the world. To condemn the world. I came to save it. The world was already condemned. That's why I came. To save it. Not to condemn it. It's already condemned. You see, without Jesus Christ, there's no question about where you're headed for. If you do not know Jesus, if you're here and you're not a Christian today, and you're listening to this, and you do not know Jesus as your Savior, you haven't asked him to save your soul and forgive you your sins. I mean, it's not... People think there's a certain way you got to ask it, a certain way you got to live. No, no. You come to God humbly with an open heart and mean it. So whatever word you choose to use, be the Spanish, English, English or French, or be there just be, uh, in my case, hillbilly. What, what would you, you know, what would you say to God that would make him save you? You don't have to save anything. You, your heart has to turn to him. You have to be willing to have him come and live in your heart and want him to and ask him to, and he'll do it. 
So God alone brings and forms life. It's God. And and with the uh, intricate care, he, ta- he fashions people in his image so that we would worship him alone all of our days. He, he made us in his image. Uh, because every human has been handcrafted by God to bear his image. Each person, each and every person, be it a, a baby that just conceived or whatever, has worth to God. So if we leave, if we leave Jesus out of our life, if we, if we uh, turn our back on our families and stuff and don't tell them, don't point them to the cross, don't tell them about Jesus, it, it hurts God. God's heart aches for souls. It says in the scripture, he's not willing that any should perish. What about us? Are we paying attention to those kind of things? Let's, uh, let's go here and look at the, some more scripture here. In, in the Luke, the 10th chapter, and I like the gospel of Luke because Luke was, was not a disciple as, as, as such, not an apostle. I'll put it that way. He's one, one of Jesus' original 12 disciples. He went with the apostle Paul, who became an uh, apostle later in his life, but but Luke went with him all over the world as a missionary. Luke was a doctor, a real doctor. And he took the time and went while everybody was alive. And he says in the first chapter of Luke, if you read it, it tells you why he did it. Because he thought, while all these people were alive, I'm going to interview them. So he went and interviewed everybody. He went and interviewed Jesus' mother. He interviewed all the disciples. He interviewed all the people that met Jesus and knew Jesus. And he wrote the Gospel of Luke accordingly. So that's what makes Luke special, I think. He went to more trouble than anybody. He was a professional guy. And he did a good job in, in the Gospel of Luke. In fact, there's a Gospel of Luke is being preached all over the world. Everywhere they got it on films. The Jesus film is, is the Gospel of Luke. Every word in it. And so as, as we look at what this man has done, let's read the scripture. Said so there's an expert in the law stood up to test him now. And as G- Luke is talking about Jesus. So somebody in the law, some some uh, uh, religious individual, very religious. So the expert in the law tells you that. The law of, of Moses that Moses handed down through God, from, from God to through Moses to the people. And they, and they knew all those rules. They knew all those things. And they had all these laws and everything. That they, and, and this guy was an expert in the law of God. But he didn't know God. He did not know God himself. You, you can read and study and do everything in the world. But you got to open your heart to Jesus. To know God. And so, let's go ahead and read this. Teacher, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, he's walking up close to the edge here. So what is it written in the law, Jesus asked him. He says, how do you read it? So he answered Jesus, and he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. So the man, he was, he got it. He got that. And, and says, Jesus says, you've answered correctly, he told him. Do this, and you will live. You will be saved. If you if you do love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbors yourself. Let me tell you this. You can't really love Jesus and not love your neighbor. Jesus told us to love our enemies. You know, for a long time, that was a hard one for me. As a Christian, as I was growing and studying and reading his word, that was a hard statement for me. But you know what? If you if you love Jesus and you pray for your enemies like he says, you the first thing you know, you do love them. You can't pray for somebody and mean it without, without actually falling in love with that person. That doesn't mean you love everything they do. That doesn't mean you love how they treat you. It doesn't say you have to do that. What it says, love them. Because God loves them. And he sent his son to die for them. No matter how wicked, how mean, how honorary and low down they are, 
He sent Jesus to die for each and every single one of us. So he says, he says this man, he says, you answered correctly. He told him, he says, do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, he says, who is my neighbor? Now, Jesus took up the question and said, this was, he, he, was, a, he was a good straight man, this guy was, for Jesus, because Jesus preached this little sermon here. He says, he gives us an example. This is a neat example. He said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. If you know anything, they used to cut a shortcut across Samaria there, and they come and they come across from Jericho. They come down the road, and and uh, anyway, this, this, this he fell into the hands of robbers. So it said the robbers they stripped him, they beat him up, they fled, leaving him half dead. Now, let's listen to the scenario that happens now. This unfolds now. Here's a man laying there on the side of the road, beat to almost to death. And and it, and it says, a priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Well, why would he do that? Well, he didn't want to become unclean by touching this guy. He was headed to the temple, probably. headed to, He was a priest. And he was, he was observing his cleanliness, his religious, spiritual cleanliness. He probably didn't want to soil himself with this guy on the side of the road. So he cuts by, goes by on the other side. Now, this is the preacher going by, or the evangelist, if you please, the priest. So he says, so he goes by and leaves him laying there. And so then the same way, a Levite, now here comes one of the deacons down the road. A Levite, he when he arrived at the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side too because he didn't want to contaminate himself. He didn't want to uh, cause himself to be unclean spiritually. So he walks by on the other side, leaves a man laying there. But a Samaritan who's not even looked at by the, by the Jewish faith as worthy of even talking to. You got, you got to understand, they, they thought these people were low in dirt. Here comes a Samaritan by on his journey. He came up to this man. And when he saw the man, he had compassion on him. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds. He poured in, poured on olive oil and wine. And he put him in the, on his own donkey, on his own animal, brought him to the inn, took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, two coins, and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him when I come back. He was on his way to some business or something. He said, when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever it costs you extra that you spend. So which he not only took the man and had him and hired this guy to take care of him while he was gone, nursed him. And then he said, I'm going to have to be gone, but when I come back, I'll give you the money that you pay if it costs any more. So he's not only worried about him now, he's worried about him from forever. And so... So he says, take care of him, and when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three, Jesus asked, do you think was a neighbor to the man who was who fell in the hands of the robbers? Well, it's easy to see. It's a Samaritan. It's what this, this, one, this rich man says. The uh, religious guy says, the one who showed mercy to him. And Jesus told him, he said, you go do the same. Maybe the man is detestable. Maybe he is laying out here in the ditch or the alley or something. But we've got to have mercy. We've got to have mercy. We've got to love them in the name of God. We don't have to necessarily get down in the mud with them. But we need to We need to love people. We need to help people. Any chance you get, God puts stuff at our doorstep. I think we're probably going to wind up in heaven one of these days if we're Christians. Those of us who are are going to wind up and see all these people that God laid out in front of us that we walked around. And if we don't don't get to heaven and we miss Jesus totally, if you're not a Christian and you wind up in hell, boy, that's going to be something you see the rest of eternity. These people that you walked around and left laying there, wherever they was at. That story is so big, it's, it's I can't even do it justice right now. So, so anyway, 
He says, the one who showed him mercy is, is the one who, who was kind to him. Then Jesus said, go and do the same. In other words, your neighbor is the people all around you. People that are suffering. People that maybe don't deserve your help. Maybe they've done stuff to you that makes them not deserve it even more. But Jesus says, we got a, here we got three people that walked around and said, preacher and a deacon and the third person was a layman a person just wasn't anybody he wouldn't he wouldn't they wouldn't even let him in the temple this man and he had more compassion than all the christians we christians are missing the boat sometimes but not having compassion on people we see people come in it's all dirty we don't even want them to sit in the pew where we normally sit I don't. I know we're really good here in this church about this. We, they, we take care of people. We do. But there's a lot of folks that don't want to be, don't want to soil themselves with an unclean person. A true servant of God loves with the heart of God. If you don't get anything else out of this lesson, please remember this: a true servant of God, a true Christian, a true person that's truly saved by Jesus loves with the heart of jesus that's the kind of love that, that the world needs it needs the love of god and it ought to flow through us we who are christians should shine like like dollars like diamonds in the sky we should shine for the cause of christ they should not see us they should see jesus in our lives and his love i i don't know how many people i've left laying on the side of the road I'm sure there's a few. Image bearers are called to love God and to love others as themselves. We should not put limits on who our neighbor is and pass them by. That's the story of this lesson that Jesus was teaching there with this good Samaritan. Says, Since all people were made in God's image, they have inherent value. God values every single soul, no matter how bad he is. And it says in the scripture, and I've said this over and over, but it says it. He's not willing that any should perish. Okay, that's what prompted Jesus. Is he's up on the cross. These people cursing him, spitting on him, and throwing things at him, and, and, and calling him all kinds of foul names and everything. He, you know what he said? He said, forgive them, Father, for they don't even know what they're doing. He loved them in spite of the fact they were killing him. That's the kind of love he wants us to have. It's what, he, it's what he tells us. It's all through the scripture. It's everywhere in this Bible. The love of Jesus is endless, unlimited. Let's read one more scripture and then we'll close this up. Second Corinthians, the third chapter, 17 through 18, said, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. With all, we all, with unveiled faces, are looking as, as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, that is, from the Lord who is the Spirit. In other words, what he's saying here is what Paul's saying. <clears throat> we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. When you, if you do, if you accept him today, he starts to work on you, but time you wind up, he's transforming you into the image of God. So he's, in other words, cleaning you up. And he doesn't throw the way the, the human was there. He doesn't wad you up and throw you up. He heals you. He makes you back to what he had originally designed you to be. And he, so he slowly molds you. And it takes a lifetime of, of, for a Christian to the, the, if he if he studies and prays and does everything he should, it takes a lifetime for him to grow, uh, to look like Jesus and to act like Jesus and to think like Jesus and to uh, most of all love like Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. If you become a Christian, that's what God wants of you. He wants you to love with the heart of Jesus. He wants you to touch people around him. So that's what this thing. All believers are being transformed into the image of God. Any of you, any of you who have accepted Jesus or in some sort of a transit to get to the image of Christ, when when we get, you know, some people say, wonder why God doesn't take me. Well, 
He may leave me here for 150 years. I don't know because it's going. I've got a lot of work to be done. But there's many, many others out there that have too. God's spirit moves us to love with God's heart. That's what this is all about. What being a Christian is all about. He moves us to love with God's heart, and He knows when we pray for those that miss that are that are use us badly i mean or or our enemies when we pray for enemies guess what our heart becomes more like jesus and the further we go we don't have to agree with what they're doing that's what i tell some of the kids who have bad families and their parents their parents are just awful and they're doing terrible things to them you know what I said, love you, honor your father and your mother. You don't have to agree with what they're doing or how they're acting. No, no. But if it wasn't for them, you wouldn't be here. God used them in spite of their ugliness, in spite of the bad things in their life. He used them to bring you here. And we have you because God sent you here on purpose. So, so at least honor them for that. We must be sensitive to God's Holy Spirit. Somehow listen to God. Listen as Christians. You know, I do a lot of, sometimes we read, pray, and do a lot of things. But just to sit and listen to God sometimes. Once in a while in the summer, I don't do it in the winter much because it's kind of hard. But in summer, I go back to the back of my place and sit down by the creek and just sit there sometimes and don't, and don't really say anything. Just listen. It's kind of makes you feel, you can feel God in everything. And so he says, the Holy Spirit, there's three people in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is the same Spirit for Jesus and the Father. He's, they share the same Spirit. Now, when we become Christians, God sends that Spirit to live in our hearts. And we become one with God. And the closer we get to him, the more, the more, the greater it is. The doctrine of the Trinity, which is, is derived from the scripture, let me read this to you. God's word teaches there's one God in three co equal persons Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see a facet of his doctrine here in 2 Corinthians 3 17 that says, The Spirit is equal with the Lord, but is also distinct as the spirit of the lord in other words the spirit that lives in your heart god sends special if you're a christian when when you ask jesus to save your soul if you're here without him listen to this when you ask him to save your soul that holy spirit's going to come into your heart and live there god's actually going to live in your heart he says, what does it say in the scripture? I'm going to write my message on the flesh, on the flesh of their hearts. He's going to actually live in our bodies with us. Wow. The closer we walk with God, the more we look and act like God. That's the lesson. That's the story of this lesson. All believers are being transformed into the image of God. All people are valued because they are made in the image of God. And then and God and God tells you that. And then First one says, all people are made in the image of God. It's read in Genesis. And it's never changed. Now, I'm I'm all I'm a big lover of animals. I had horses. I loved horses. I've had dogs and I love some of them. Uh, we got a cat now and I about half love it. I'm having a hard time with the cat. You know? It's outside, it stays outside. My son brought it to us. It's one of them gifts you get from your family, you know. Anyhow, he does keep the mice and the rats down. But I about half love the cat. Well, I really love the horses. But they're not people. We, we get our, mix, our signals all mixed. People are something different than anything else God's made. So we call on the name of Jesus to save you today. Hear our cry. Jesus will. He'll hear it when you call out. Let's have a closing prayer. Our Father and our God, as we come before your throne again, we thank you for your love that you sent to us through your son, Jesus. We thank you for the fact that you made us in, in your image. You made us, Father, so we can love you and share the universe with you. You made us, Father, so we can be your family. 
you said you say in the scripture that we're going to be heirs and joint heirs with Jesus himself to the kingdom of God. What a statement that is. Do we understand what that really means? It means that we're going to be the family of God forever if we accept and trust Jesus as our Savior. Help those here listening to this to do that today, Father. Help those of us who have asked Jesus to save us to understand what we have been given. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.